the jewels home. Then cheer, my brother, cheer. Our trials will soon be o'er. Our loved ones we shall meet, shall meet upon that golden shore. We're pilgrims and we're strangers here. We're seeking a city to come. The lifeboat soon is coming to gather the jewels home. Sometimes the devil tempts me and says it's all in vain. started here, if that's all right with everyone, glad to see everybody. You got the church shoes on, the church shirts on, church clothes on, and the church smile on. You should have a church smile on this morning. Yeah. Because if you're saved this morning, you have victory, amen. If you're not saved this morning, you have the door to victory. It's available for you 24-7. And this morning, you're going to hear some preaching of God's Word, just to inspire you. Amen. Uh, just inspire us all. We're in God's house this morning, so we should be happy. And we're going to sing about that victory this morning. Page 341, if you will, in the blue hymn book. Grab that blue hymn book, page 341. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Sing it like you mean it. Amen. Are you happy you got victory this morning? Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Doesn't sound like it. Are you happy that you have victory this yeah. morning? Amen. Yeah. All right. I'm hearing it. All right. All right. This is better than a Georgia game or a Braves game amen. this morning. Amen. This is a better victory than anything you can have. Jesus Christ. Amen. Victory in Jesus. We'll sing the first and the last. So that's verse one and verse three. And we'll sing it loud. Amen.
us this morning, please. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for giving us a place we can come and worship, pray for each other, our friends and loved ones. Lord, we always ask that we just hear a good message each time yes. we come. We look forward to it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Page 243, if you will, remain standing. Page 243. <coughs> I am resolved. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Amen. Amen. He's there. He's available 24-7, like I said earlier. Amen. I am resolved. We'll sing three verses. First, second, and the last. One, two, and four. Page 243 in the blue hymn book. <coughs>
bring your favorite Hawaiian or island foods. I still think we ought to do a pig in a pit. You think yeah. we can pull that off? That'd be neat. Yeah, I think it would be too. Some banana leaves in there. It'd be great. Uh, I'll bring you oh, over somebody else you. <laughs> oh, brother Brian. Uh, but, and then uh, the best dressed couple win king and queen. How about that? And uh, this will replace our third Sunday fellowship for the month. But we're looking forward to having a good, uh, good time with this. We've done this before, and it's always a good time. So we look forward to it. And uh, so make sure that you mark your calendar and plan for, uh, for that. And so that'll be on the 30th. Good to see Brother Robert. He had back be able Amen. to be with us. Uh, had some surgery. Been out for a couple of weeks, but I'm glad he's able to be back. I certainly do appreciate him. Good to see Sister uh, Elaine come in. And she brought Mark with her again. I'm glad of that. <laughs> good, good to see them. Elaine, we, good to see the Lawsons, too. They're going through a lot of changes. And uh, so, Lord bless them. Uh, Elias has grown up though, and he's Squanto. That's what I call him, is Squanto. Mm -hmm. And he's got a haircut. He don't look out like our little baby boy anymore. He kind of got that uh, young man look to him. <laughs> so uh, he's growing up. Get over it. That's just what <laughs> happens. You know, they grow up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's good to see them this morning. And Sister Tracy, would you give us a quick update, please, on Riley? How's what situation with the um, baby? Um, she's still doing very well. We're supposed to be expecting to call Friday to see if we got a room at the Ronald McDonald House. Right. Um, it'll, and then if we do, we have to leave Sunday. So it'll be me, Christopher, and Riley will be going up there. Um, Sunday, and then she'll have pre-op Monday and heart surgery Tuesday. Okay. And that's, uh, that would be a week from today, right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so, uh, make sure you keep us informed on that. And you do pray this is a very serious surgery on this baby. And there, a lot of things need to come together, a uh, place for the parents to stay and other things. So you pray about that. If you want a little more details, rather than do it while we're on, while we're streaming, you see Sister Tracy after the service, and she can fill you in a little more uh, on that. But we certainly do want to pray for this couple and for uh, that uh, that little baby, and the Lord's well able to take care of that all together. Pray for uh, for Miss Pamela's prayer for Jennifer that uh, they're. Her there and their family would be traveling. Noah, you're familiar with Noah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any birthdays or anniversaries this week? I don't know if they are or not. I ain't got a clue. We'll we'll try to look that up and let you know. Uh, anybody in here having a birthday this week? Raise your hand. That's one way to find out. Anybody that will admit it. <laughs> we have our um, adoption anniversary. That's right. Yeah, that is. And what day is that? The 14th. The 14th. Yeah, you want to remember that? Six years. That's a big. I, I remember. Let me reminisce for a minute. I remember meeting in the judge's office with you guys, and uh, when when the papers were signed, everything was official. Yeah, it was it was a great day. Great day. And yeah, went to Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Not to be cracker barrel, it's hard to beat, ain't it? But, uh, but it was and it, a great day, and I still got pictures of that. Amen. Thank the Lord for it. Helen Bridges on the 14th and Janice Powell on the 15th both could use encouraging cards. Okay. Miss Bridges on the 14th, Miss Janice Powell on the 15th, and then July the 14th is Gotcha Day for the uh, Rosses. So praise the Lord, a lot to celebrate this week. So uh, wherever the party's going to be, just send out a text. We'll all be there with bells on. How about that? All right, party or not. A uh, lot going on. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Don't forget these birthdays and things like that. And uh, the announcement's coming up. All right, great stuff, great stuff. All right, Brother Brian. All right. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. 
Yeah. We're going to party on with a celebration in the Lord's house this morning. Amen. It's exciting we get to be here. So we're going to keep singing. And who keeps us singing? He keeps us singing. So let's stand. Turn to page 250, Master of Sethways. He keeps me singing. We're going to sing. We're actually going to, we're going to blow some minds this morning. So if there's any, any liberals watching, don't get upset. We're going to sing one verse and we're going to walk around, shake hands, hug each other, tell each other we love each other. Yes, amen. And just be happy we're in the house of the Lord this morning. So we're going to sing one verse and we'll shake hands and we'll amen. come back and sing amen. one or two or three or four more verses. He keeps me singing, page 250. We'll start with that first verse. Let's walk around and shake hands after that first verse. Amen.
sing another one that Haley was going to sing for us this morning. Okay, Haley picking one out, and we'll sing one while she picks one out. What do you say? Y'all like singing this morning? Amen. Let's uh, let's slow singing it down. Good to me. Singing I good. Like it. I'm up here, and he says we're singing good, so we know he has a hearing problem. So we've got an appointment for the ear doctor. Let's go to page 228. Page 228. We'll slow it down just a little bit. He hideth my soul. We'll sing three verses. He hideth my soul. Page 228. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last. Then Haley, you pick out a song and come on up and sing for us this morning. Amen. Page 228. He hideth my soul.
thank you, Sister Haley. That song, you did it as pretty as you look. So that was a, quite a blessing. Jeremiah 18 this morning. Thank you, Brother Brian, for the good song service. Hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't have anything. He's still a hottie, that's yeah, all. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll leave that to you, Lord. <laughs> Book of Jeremiah, chapter 8. Or 18, rather. Jeremiah chapter 18. I'm going to continue the series about the potter and the clay. I had this series on my mind for quite a while. And it seemed like the Lord opened the door for us to go in this direction. I trust it to be a help and a blessing to you. If nothing else, it has been a great help and a blessing to me to go back and study it through this. And allow the God, the Holy Spirit, to speak to my heart. There are some... Real jewels in the Word of God, if you'll take time to look through it. This account here, these few verses about the potter and the clay, to me are just one of those great gems. Dr. Ivor Powell wrote a book many years ago about uh, gems in Scripture, scriptural gems. I forget just how the title is. It's there in my office. And this is one of those places. And uh, I love it. Thank the Lord for it. Haley, I, hope, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I hope at some point, too, you go back to the theater. I'm, we missed the summer theater this year. Uh, Sister Donna and I would make a date out of going to the, to the little theater in gray and see, and we'd, we'd kind of like we normal people. We'd go to the, have dinner and go to the theater and watch a production. But I enjoy seeing our young people do that. All of this morning I want to preach on fixing the clay. We've talked about free, uh, finding the clay and freeing the clay. And this morning I want to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, preach about fixing the clay. Chapter 18, verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise. And go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then went, then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemeth good to the potter to make it. When the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the day clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hand, O oh, house. When I started this series, I talked to you about how I know this is a prophecy, a word to the house of Israel, but the application to us. You and I are clay in the potter's hands. And he is molding us and making us if we will surrender to his will. A vessel unto honor that he will use that will be a blessing to others. But it takes some work. And we so today we move from the pit in which the clay was found to the potter's house. We have journeyed with the potter as he went down to the dismal swamp of humanity and dug through the filth of mankind's sin from the time Adam fell. And is found in that dismal place something of great value to the potter, the clay, you and I. And he went through much to find it. He more indignity than you and I could ever imagine. We do not have, really have any idea of the price Christ paid for my sin and for your sin. We enjoy the blessings of the grace of God, but not until we see him face to face will we really ever comprehend the price that was paid. Will we understand the pain that was endured? 
For we understand the affliction that came because of our sin. You may think of some of the most grotesque figures of history and the awfulness to mankind that they facilitated and think that must be what the preachers talk about. No, I'm talking about those wicked, vile thoughts that trace through your mind when nobody but you and God knows them. They hurt the Lord Jesus Christ just as much as anything else does. For those thoughts come as much out of our heart as they do out of our mind. And Lord, pray that they never come out our lips or in the actions of our hands or feet. And so we have went from the dismal swamp where the potter found the clay to a time of freeing the clay, the work of getting it free from the place that it was in. No more to be entrapped again with the chains of bondage of sin if you're saved. But hear me well if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are as hell bound today as you've ever been. And that's not hate speech. Say that with a broken heart. Because nobody ought to go to hell. Nobody. It was not even a place made for you. It was a place made for the Satan and his angels. And you could read Dante's Inferno until you know it by heart and you'll still never describe the awfulness of hell. And he rescued us from that. He freed us from that. They are a lot of songs and that describe a lot of things. Some of those are very scriptural. Some of them are not. But to borrow a line from one of them, the chains are gone. That held you in bondage to the sin of humanity, the sin of your own heart are gone because the potter has freed the clay. And there was great work and great labor involved in that. And the potter did a great work. But the clay now has been rescued and it's being made fit for the potter's use. And he has brought it to a place where the impurities and the filth of the pit will be separated from the clay. Let me remind you that when... <clears throat> you were first saved or anybody else was first saved all of the world had not didn't immediately fall off of you as time went along God did a great work in your heart and you begin to see that this was wrong and this was wrong and this did not need to be a part of your life or that did not be a part because the Holy Spirit dwelled in you in your bosom in your heart and it showed you the difference between right and wrong. Do you remember when you first got saved and you maybe went to do or say or go somewhere that you once did and all of a sudden you, you realize this is wrong and I, I don't need to go there. How did you know that? The Holy Spirit of God told you that. And it takes a great work but the potter now has the clay where the impurities and the filth of the pit are going to be separated from the clay. The process isn't always easy and it isn't always clean. But it is always necessary. We have been saved by the grace of God, taken out of a horrible pit. As the psalmist said in Psalm 40 verse 2, he said, you, you heard my cry and you, you rescued me. You Tuck me out of a horrible pit. What pit was that, preacher? The pit of your own sin. And you and I are saved out of sin, out of the world. But it takes time and patience many times to get the world out of us. <clears throat> In fact, if you think that you have reached some sort of sinless perfection, let me, let me just illustrate a simple but yet accurate illustration of how it works. And I, you, I, I'm sure I've used it before. I think I've used every illustration I've got before. 
Some of you can tell as good as I can. But uh, it, this happened again this week, and I was thinking about this and had been working on this in, in my study and went by Ingalls uh, grocery store to pick up something. You know, you if you live in gray, you can't hardly make it without going to Ingalls once a day. Whether you need anything or not, you just go in. Walk around, window shop. I walk by, I walk by the meat counter, look at the steaks, and think, well, it must be something to be able to afford with meat. <laughs> and, and, and look, and go, then go by and get me some bologna and go on to the house, because that's about all we can get. But I was going in, I, and I had my little buggy, and going, and, uh, and uh, they're playing music in the background. And I hadn't even paid any attention to it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm standing there looking at the cans of baked beans, and I'm singing. <laughs> and I, boy, I thought, man, the world is still in me. Uh, no, you wasn't there, and I'm glad you wouldn't. <laughs> and see, it takes time and patience to get the world out of us. And the potter may work quite a while on the clay to get rid of all the impurities. But he steadily works. And he works the clay with a gentle hand and a gentle touch that only the Master knows how to do. I have not spent a great deal of time watching a potter. I would like to I watch videos, which is not as good, but it will do. But I have watched them take what they call the raw clay and begin to work and manipulate it with their hands and apply the pressure and apply the... And they literally feel through that clay till they feel ever impurity that's there. And they take it out. You say it may be small. It may be small, but it matters. <coughs> In one particular one I was watching, the potter kept feeling through the clay, and he would take the clay in his fingers and work it through his fingers, and finally he would feel something. And the tiniest, Brother Renee, the tiniest of stone, he would take out of that, and he went on to explain that even the tiniest of stone, uh, when the clay is molded and put into the, uh, to the, to the furnace to cure the clay, will cause a great impurity, and we'll get to firing the clay uh, in, in a week or two. Uh, but even those tiniest of impurities have got to be worked out. And you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, gave His own blood, gave His own life to save you from sin, uh, uh, that He might create in you a vessel unto honor, and He's got every right to finger through uh, every part of your life uh, uh, and put His hand on every impurity that exists uh, and take it out of a life that is completely yielded to Him. Amen. It is His right. Yes. It is His privilege. And only the real, a real potter can feel the difference between some impurities and the clay because they're so small. The big things are not hard. The sticks and the big rocks and the chunks of a different type of clay or something may not be too hard to filter through. But those tiny little impurities, those tiny little things... God may have his finger on something in your life and you say this is so insignificant. Why is God even, even convicting me? Why is God even troubling me with it? Because he wants you to be a vessel unto honor. Yes. And there's something there that doesn't need to be there. You say, well, preacher, it doesn't affect anybody but me. No, I want to tell you the vessel of your life affects everybody around you. Listen to me, Dad. The kind of vessel you are in your home is going to affect every member of your home. Mom, grandmother, aunt, uncle, whoever you may be, whoever God has allowed within the circle of, the, of your influence, whatever you are and whatever impurities you possess are going to affect everyone around you. You do not sin alone. It may not apply as purely as I'd like for it to, but no person is an island. You are connected to somebody somewhere, and if you're saved, you're connected to the body of Christ through the blood of Christ. And what you do affects it. 
The health of this church as a church body, as a corporate together body, is dependent on the health of your spiritual walk with Christ. You say, oh no, preacher, that's your responsibility to keep the church healthy. Hey, listen, I can't finger through the heart, your heart and life like God the Holy Spirit can. And he and only he has the absolute authority and the right and the and the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells you to put a finger on what needs to be changed. And as the potter is preparing this clay for a vessel, he is working a pinch here, a pinch there, and working it through his hand. You know what? You know what? What happened? In a little while, the potter's hands become the same color as the clay. Do you realize how intimately involved the Lord Jesus Christ is in your life? That the, the hand, the the hands of the potter become the same color as the clay. If you look at a real potter's hands, you'll see they have no fingernails. You're not going to see a potter, a female potter. This, that's where the town had her nails did. Because the clay is going to grind them off. And they tell me that a real potter could crack a safe and never leave a fingerprint because they're worn smooth. Because he's been so involved in the clay. If I could paint a picture with words this morning and get you to see what I'm trying to illustrate, is how this morning... That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are so working in your life till their hands are stained with you. Their fingers and hands are worn where they have rubbed the rough edges of your life. They, they, they have... They bear in their, in their hands the marks of working the clay because they are so interested in the clay. That nothing that has happened in your life has been outside of the knowledge of God. And he is working with that gentle touch that only the master can work. So with that in mind, a few things this morning. <laughs> and I'll be done. Number one, there is the time frame work that is involved. God is not in a hurry. You and I may be, but God is not. Now, I, I am a person, I, I'm i complex. That's all I'd say. Sometimes I don't even like myself. But I want God to get in a hurry over some things, and I want Him to take His time on another. But I'll tell you, when it comes to molding and working your life, God is not in a hurry. You may be, but He's not. And there's the time work or the time framework that's involved in, in clay. First of all, He distinguishes the clay. He has, he has found the clay. He has freed the clay. And now He has the clay at the potter's house, which it really is a, type, a picture of the church. And he's got the clay on the wheel and he's removing all the impurities out of that clay as he works. The wheels are not turning at this point. The potter is just working the clay. But there's one thing about the clay at this point. It will never go back to the pit. And when you are saved by the grace of God and he got you out of a horrible pit, you are not going back to the pit. He did not save you. He did not redeem you to return you to the pit. It's a good picture of eternal security. And, and the clay will never go back to the, to the pit. It is now in the possession of the potter. The potter has redeemed it, if you would. He has brought it out. He has found it and freed it. Uh, and, and now he's removing all the impurities from it. It belongs to the potter because the work uh, of the potter in freeing the clay, it is his possession. And he has distinguished it as belonging to him. And it will never go back to the pit. 
And then not only does he distinguish the clay, but there is the drying process. And after the potter has removed a lot of the big impurities, the obvious things, he allows the clay to dry because it gets the water from the pit where it was dig out of the clay. Sometimes after we're saved, we wonder, what in the world is God doing to us? Why, why are we going through this trial? Why are we going through this valley? Why are, is this? God is simply letting uh, uh, the world dry up in you. Uh, uh, don't find what the potter is doing. He is working to work greater than you can see. Uh, and it may not be a pleasant process. But I'm going to tell you, if God's ever going to do anything but for you and through you and to you, He's got to get a lot of the world out of you. And if the clay goes through a drying process, gets rid of all the worldly influences. You see, God may save you, but sometimes we stay, may still smell and look like the world. The clay may still smell and look like the pit from which it came. Have you ever noticed when you go down through here through Gordon and Ivy and down that way where the kaolin mines are? Have you ever noticed you can smell that kaolin in the air? You can see it in the air. Everything's got a white dust on it. God may save you, but sometimes, and He does save you if you ask Him, but it may take a little while to get the smell of the world out of you. And so there is the time framework where he distinguishes the clay and where he allows the clay to dry. Secondly, I want you to notice the turning force that is involved. That takes place in the potter's house in God's house. There are two wheels on a potter's wheel. If you've ever seen it, there is a very simple potter's wheel where the bottom wheel is just a round wheel. It has a shaft that is connected Great, uh, directed to the upper shaft. And it's, the potter turns the bottom and it naturally just like an axle turns both wheels, it turns the upper wheel. Some are a little more complex. They may have belts or ropes or something else. To turn. Some, but generally it has two wheels. And then as the potter puts that clay on the wheel and begins to work it, there is a force with the foot of the potter as he determines the speed of the wheel that turns. And the speed of the wheel determines how he works the clay. You see, the bottom wheel is like the Word of God. It is the force and the power that moves everything else. And it is controlled by the potter. Say, preacher, I don't understand all that's working in my life. I don't understand all that's going in. Why is this not happening? Don't worry, the potter has got his hand on the clay. And he's working it in his time. It would be a good time if I could have it. Dr. Seltzer had the little videos where he would actually be on the platform and working the clay and making a pot and explaining as he goes through it. But you know the Word of God works on us. That's why I encourage you to read your Bible. And by the way, if reading your Bible was not important, why would the devil fight it so hard? It obviously has got to be important. And as we read that Word of God, and as God the Holy Spirit works in our heart, and we begin to see the things in our life that need to work uh, and, and need to change. We need the Word of God. It is the force and the power that moves everything else. It's controlled by the potter, and he is continually working through the preaching, the teaching, the reading, the praying. All of the Word of God has got an effect on us as it changes us. The top wheel, then is where the clay is. It shows us a picture of the will of God. It makes it possible for the for the vessel to be formed. The vessel is not formed on the bottom wheel by the foot of the potter. It's formed on the top wheel by the hands of the potter. And he's working it and molding it and making it. And by the way, when that, when that potter takes that clay, he puts it in the middle of that wheel. 
because the potter is not going to waste his time chasing that clay all around that wheel. He puts it in the middle of that wheel. And if God has put you in the middle of his wheel, don't keep fighting him to get outside of his wheel to a place you don't need to be. He's not obligated to chase you down. And that potter then is beginning to work as he turns that bottom wheel. He watches the speed. He watches the action. He watches everything about it. Thirdly, you see the tool factor. And it requires the skill of the master and the tool factor. The, the potter adds pure, clean water from a vessel that he has already made. And it makes the clay pliable so that he can form it. So you've got this clay that has been been found, it has been freed, and now it's been fixed. And it's now on the potter's wheel and it's been dried to get some of the worldly smell and stench out of it. And he's taking that pure, clean water of the Word of God and adds the right amount at the right time and continually working that clay to make it as pliable as he wants it, as it needs to be, so that he can begin to shape it and form it and make it according to his divine will. You see, there is a couple of tools that a potter uses. One is the conforming tool, the trial. Y'all know what a trial is? It's kind of a triangle shaped tool. How many of you have ever laid any block or brick in your lifetime? How many of you have ever helped somebody lay it? I'm not much of a lay brick or made, but I, I work Brother Kitchen, one of my first jobs away from the home, away from home off the farm, <coughs> was a laborer for a block mason. And I don't know how, them fellows laid block faster than I could tote them to them and faster than I could make more. I worked that summer and I was so glad to see that summer come to an end uh, because all I heard is hurry up and bring some mud up here. Hurry up and bring that block up here. I mean, I couldn't get them fast enough. They act like they was paying me good money or something. I don't know what their problem was. But the trial, he'd take that, and a potter uses a trial, though, and he begins to cut away all of that clay that he can't use. It's kind of like when a vine dresser is working the vineyard. Part of his job is cutting away the dead and the useless branches so that the vine may produce fruit and more fruit. Many times the Lord has to spend time trimming us. And it's a principle that's found in Scripture, like I mentioned, the pruning of the vine so that it will bring forth. And that is a big tool, and it's a major tool, and he's using that tool, but he's using it carefully. By the way, the, the, the potter doesn't take out the trial and just go to swing it and hack it and jab it and cut it and dob it uh, into that clay. It is a very precise, a very moved, a very careful. Uh, and he does it with great loving care. And by the way, when God is cutting from you all of the things that don't need to be in your uh, life, remember that he's doing it with such tender care that he's not has any intention of ruining you, but molding you and making you. Amen. Amen. He's doing it with more love than you could ever imagine. More care than you could ever imagine. Cutting those things away. Then there is the correcting tool that's used. And it's a knife. A type of a knife. And it cuts away all the rough parts. You've got to remember potters in these days didn't make these cute little vessels about this big that you put some fake flowers in. They were, many times they were huge, they were large. And they were made, they were an absolute necessity of a functioning society, household especially. Sometimes then after the big work is done, God takes that little correcting tool and he'll work on your life in little places where he needs to. Can I just tell you this morning, allow the potter to do his work. Mm. The vessel will be much prettier in the end. Allow God to do his work. And then fourthly, there's the touch feature. 
And this is one I like, and I'll try not to get hung up on this. The potter's touch makes all the difference. And the potter gets to a certain place with that pot, and from that point on, his hand never comes off of it. His hand is always on it. He might change this or change that a little bit. Just a little pinch of the finger will make a difference in the thickness of the wall of a vessel. Or just a little squeeze in a certain area will add another dimension to the shape of the vessel. But it's all under the touch of the master's hand. And it's the touch feature. He touches the clay. It's a hands-on policy. You see, it is shaped by the potter's hand by the potter's wheel and by the potter's hands. The only time during this process I mentioned that his hand really never comes off, the, off of it and he doesn't really except for just a brief period of time. He might take his hand off and step back and look at the vessel. Sometimes they'll see where they may have one side a little off and it has a little bit of a wobble to it. He'll go back and touch it. But you see, it is shaped by the potter's wheel and by the potter's hand and by the potter's look. And he checks it constantly to make sure it's working to his wheel. And let me remind you this morning, the Lord's hands are on you if you belong to him. <coughs> if you've been saved by his grace, then he's working to make you a vessel into honor. He may have to work hard to remove some of the impurities and the smell and the color of the world from you, but he's working. You see, the clay doesn't rebel against the potter and says, I don't want to be this kind of vessel, and I don't want you having your hand on me, the pay, and, and it's not going to get up and walk off the wheel. And see, that's where the likeness is changed, because God made you and I with a free will. You can get up this morning from that pew that you're sitting on and walk out those doors lost if you choose to because God made you a free will. God, you can get up this, this morning and walk out of here and say, I will not be conformed to what he wants. I'm going to live my own life. And I'm going to live it my way. Because you have a will. But when you decide you're going to follow his will, rather, or your will rather than his will, you remember you have no choice on the consequences that brings. None. In Jeremiah 2, he said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring an expected end. And the potter has an expected end when he's got clay on the wheel. But the clay doesn't rebel against the potter, but responds to what the potter is doing. It's in full cooperation to the will of the potter. Let me ask you, why do we work so hard to resist what the Lord wants in our lives? When he's working for our good and his glory. There's a great, I think, picture in this potter and the clay. And we saw him find the clay and free the clay, but now he's fixing the clay. Do you see God wants something greater for you than what you want for yourself? The Lord Jesus Christ paid such a high price for you gave himself so completely for you that he's not willing for you to be cast aside. He's not willing for you to go back to the pit. It's not his will for you to become like you were when he found you. Father has something in mind. If I could, if I can, there's a song by the title Clay in the Potter's Hand. Sister Amelia Petty, Kim Gooden and her sister, 
Brother Ray Fledger used to sing that song, if I could find a copy of that song. It's a good song to go along with this. But let me tell you this morning, sitting in this audience, they play that God has been working on many, many years in this audience. There's some young tender clay that's fresh in you and really doesn't have much of the world in it, and I pray it never does. But it doesn't matter whether it's old or new. The potter has something in mind. And I pray this morning you'll let God, the Holy Spirit, take the precious water of the Word of God and the gentle touch of the Master Potter and make your life a vessel and a you allow him to do that? You've been found. You've been freed. Allow him to fix you. Now I'll tell you this morning, there's some folks here that needs fixed. Would you allow him to fix you? Would you? <coughs> Father, this morning in Jesus' name, Lord, I come before the presence and Lord, before the throne of glory and ask you, God, to work it. Lord, I believe I preached the message you asked me to preach. Lord, I know the Holy Spirit will work in hearts if they'll let them. But maybe there's some folks here this morning that say need to come and say, Lord, I need to be fixed. Lord, would you fix me? I can't do it. Lord, this church can't do it as a whole. We can't do it. It takes the touch of the Master's hand and that water of the Word of God. So, Lord, this morning, speak to us, I pray. Help us. Lord, I want to be a better vessel myself, cleaner, purer. Lord, I pray that you'd help me, Lord, surrender everything I've got to the will of the Father. But Lord, as you speak to hearts this morning, help them respond according to your word, according to your will. In Jesus' precious, precious name I ask. <coughs> Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning as we sing of God the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And you're willing, and you know that you need to, if you know you need to, and you're willing, then why don't you come spend some time at this altar this morning? You surrender your clay to the hand of the potter and let him fix what needs to be fixed in your life. Would you do that? Let's see.